Welcome to the Waste Not What Not podcast. I'm Philippa Ross, human ecologist, enthusiologist, author and energy healer, bringing you inspirational interviews, news and tips to rebuild the relationship between people and the planet the way nature intended by revitalizing our natural resources, minimizing waste and maximizing human potential. I trust you'll discover seeds of hope for a vibrant future so you can cultivate and transform them to suit your own lifestyle in order for us to collectively create a world where reverence for the diversity of all life is honoured. You'll find all the show notes in the description and lots more about me and my work at philipparos.com. And don't forget, if you like what you hear, be sure to share far and wide. Hello, Waste Busters. Welcome to episode 40. Wow, what an uplifting week I've had. I was privileged to have been asked to be on the panel at Leif Cox event in Auckland on Wednesday night. A truly humble man, doing extraordinary work to protect orangutan, tigers and elephants. Embracing the broader ecosystem of the rainforest and the wisdom of the indigenous people to create an environment where all life thrives. I encourage you to listen to last week's episode with Leif to inspire you to be part of a future you can believe in. One creature we tend to take for granted is the humble bumblebee. And I've just caught on to the fact that September is Bee Awareness Month here in New Zealand. I didn't know we have 28 types of native bees and that they need to visit 4 million flowers to make 1 kilogram of honey. And a whopping third of the food we eat is the result of pollination by bees and other insects. The Awareness Month is run by a collective voluntary organisation known as Apiculture New Zealand who provide nationwide support for honey producers and the agriculture and horticultural industries, all of whom play a crucial role in the cycle of life. Without bees, the availability and diversity of fresh produce would decline substantially, which would undoubtedly impact human nutrition. You might like to listen to the interview I had with beekeeper Dr Isaac Flitter in December of last year. There's a link in the show notes. Leif and Isaac's work with very different species has brought them closer to themselves and helped them see the interconnectedness of all life and how invaluable every species is in the web of life. This integrates beautifully with my guest this week, Greg Hart a regenerative farmer who provides a fascinating insight into what he's learned about working with nature and how the process of renewal and restoration helps the ecosystem become resilient to natural fluctuations that cause disturbance or damage. Now into the new section of the podcast. The wisdom of the Māori culture is paying huge dividends for restoring river and sea life in Rotorua and the Bay of Plenty, using the abundance of the natural flax resources we have. Invasive weeds in three lakes in Rotorua have been eradicated using flax mats that block out the sunlight, causing the weeds to rot and die. While in the Bay of Plenty, spat lines weaved from flax have provided a lifeline for larva to latch onto and grow, increasing muscle numbers tenfold. The Māori culture recognised connection to nature and see protection of the land and sea as a guardianship role to enrich both their lives and that of the entire ecosystem. Keep New Zealand Beautiful start their nationwide clean-up tomorrow, Saturday 17th of September. So if you feel you can spare time to help, then check out the link in the show notes to find out what's happening in an area near you. On Wednesday this week, the 21st, is both International Peace Day and World Gratitude Day. At its core, peace is about building societies where all members feel valued and given an opportunity to flourish alongside one another, irrespective of race, religion or any other sector we've come to segregate people by. We are one big family living on the same planet. So the sooner we learn to honour, have reverence and include the rich diversity of all life, the more likely we'll be to achieve peace. The art of gratitude preserves humanity amidst chaos by holding space as we're reminded of the bigger mission to unite as one literally dissolving our differences by becoming aware of the beauty of life. Award-winning cinematographer Louis Schwartzberg, who produced the phenomenal Fantastic Fungi film, is launching a worldwide opportunity to see Gratitude Revealed, a film he's been working on for 40 years. There's also a link in the show notes. Some fantabulous news for three dolphins in Bali. 
Johnny, Rocky and Rambo, who were released to the open seas last week after being in the care of Uma Lumba Rehabilitation, Release and Retirement Centre for years while they recovered from life in captivity until they relearned how to live in the wild. One final thing to mention before I introduce my guest is the brilliant work of Zach Bush and what he's doing to wake the world up to the destructive effect that glyphosate is having on our food system and health. I'd highly recommend you sign up for the webinar he's doing on Wednesday so you'll receive a recording of the conversation linking glyphosate, gluten sensitivity and gut dysbiosis. Now to my guest, Greg Hart, a man who shares how his 20-year journey into the wonders of regenerative farming has enlightened his world in so many ways, not least of which was the opportunity it gave him to see life as a co-creator and through the lens of how long-term sustainability enriches the lives of people and the planet. Welcome to the show, Greg. It's lovely to have you with me. Thank you, Philippa. It's great to be with you. I just want to enlighten the listeners as to how I found you, because a lot of this podcast is filling my own bucket at the same time as educating other people. And I saw that you did a TED Talk, and it was dated May 2021, but it's only just been released. And it was all about regenerative farming. And for me, it's a kind of buzzword around the moment. And I really wanted to get to the crux of actually what it is. Your talk was so inspiring because you could feel the excitement in your voice and you spoke of hope and fulfillment. And you also spoke of the negative effects that farming has had on the farming community so far as suicide is concerned. And because September is all about suicide day on the 10th and mental health week beginning on the 26th so I thought no better time than the moment yeah exactly so what is is so what is regenerative farming well first for me it is a change of mindset and the way that we approach growing food and caring for the land and so much of where we've got to as a species at the moment has been about domination and control and I mean, that, of course, even goes into our sort of colonial aspirations, how we've dominated other cultures. And New Zealand was one of the later land masses in the world to be inhabited by humans. And when the white people came here and and Maori were already established in New Zealand, again, it's that kind of colonial domination and control. And of course, then we just brought our ideas from Europe and and Britain and that about how we produce food and land. And we just forced that upon the landscape here. And so I think with hindsight now, coming from that European approach to it, is to show a bit of humility and understanding and and look at the knowledge and experience that Maori gained from living in this country for many centuries. And then as humanity evolves and we grow up, We're kind of like teenagers that are just hitting adulthood and we've just been all about taking. And now I think that awareness is coming and it's a change of consciousness that we have to be working with nature and leaving space for nature and understanding, you know, that all the benefits that nature does to us. And and so then we're applying that kind of philosophy to looking after the land and growing food. And so there's a number of different practices that we do for regenerative agriculture It's not a prescriptive thing, which has got to be pretty appealing for a lot of conservative farmers because nobody's pushing anything down your throat and say, you have to do this. Um, Regenerative agriculture is all about outcomes and those outcomes can be measured in the health of our soil and the health of the food that we're producing and water and we measure the biodiversity on our land. And so there's a whole lot of measurables, you know, which cuts all the bullshit out of it. (laughs) Um, Of course, understanding that nothing's perfect and we still have plenty of challenges going on on our farm. But, you know, we've set that firm aspiration that we want to improve the health of our environment and and the land that we have management and control over. So you've been a farmer for a while. You were brought up on a farm, I believe. Yeah, that's right. I grew up on a farm with my family in Methven, mid-Canterbury. And after school, I went and did a Bachelor of Agriculture degree at Massey University. And then after working for a couple of years, I um, went off and did my couple of years traveling overseas. And while I was away, my parents sold up the farm in Canterbury and shifted to a property in Hawke's Bay. So, yeah, we now live at Mungarara Station, which is about a half an hour south of Hastings or Havelock North in central Hawke's Bay. So I guess just a bit of an insight to people listening about the farm. So Mungarara is 600 hectares. Mm-hmm. And 
It is a beautiful piece of paradise, and um, we're very fortunate that we have about a 30 hectare lake on the property. Wow. Um, Kokohini Paro is a Maori name, or Horseshoe Lake. And also very fortunate that there's still about 13 hectares of old indigenous native forest on the farm because Hawke's Bay has been quite cleared and denuded of the native vegetation. Yep. And so we're lucky to still have that native bush on the farm, which has been a big part of the inspiration for trying to restore that balance and bring back not only just native biodiversity, but adapting it and, and moulding using exotic plants as well, but respecting the native plants and the native birds and insects that live in there. So how long ago did you start integrating regenerative farming? Because I guess it's not a all or nothing thing, is not it? No. And people are going to come at regenerative agriculture from a number of different aspects because some people might be driven by some health issue or something like that. They might just say, right, we've become aware of the issue of chemicals going yep. into food. Some people might be just looking at it to get better environmental outcomes. And you know, there's a, a growing awareness about those issues. And there is also economic reasons for, for going because ultimately, I think it is going to earn as much or more money than our higher input, what we call conventional at the moment. But for me, a big part of it, while all those aspects of, <laughs> I've just mentioned were part of our decision to go down a regenerative track, it is probably sustainability has been one of the bigger driving forces for me. And understanding that agriculture, pastoral agriculture, is the backbone of the New Zealand economy. Yep. And that pastoral agriculture, the way we have been doing it for the last 70 or so years since the Second World War, really, or probably around about that time, has been around bringing phosphate fertilisers in, mostly from North Africa. Initially, we were getting the phosphate from the Pacific Islands, and we exhausted that supply of phosphate. And so now we're bringing it in from North Africa and it's a finite resource and requires a lot of energy to dig it up and to transport it and to get it to New Zealand and to process it and get it onto our lands. And it just didn't seem a sustainable system to base our food production and our economy on. So yeah, for about 20 years now, we've been looking at alternative ways of trying to continue to produce food, but without relying on those inputs from the other side of the planet. And also being very aware of how much energy it takes to produce our food. Potentially, we're at that point right now where this ever-increasing abundant supply of fossil fuel energy might be about to change. And, and certainly, you know, the prices are going up and that is reflected in not just the price of fuel, but also, you know, the price of fertilizer and price of so many other inputs. And so regenerative agriculture is also about reducing our reliance on off-farm inputs. So we become more independent and more resilient. Human health is another massive driver for trying to produce healthier food because there's massive issues at the moment. And I think the number one solution to human health issues and environmental issues, climate change, and everything like that is food and how we grow it. There was a book put out a few years ago called Drawdown by Paul Hawken. And in that, they got a massive team of scientists to look at all the solutions for climate change. And there's population issues and energy issues. But the number one solution when you put a few of them together is our food system, how it's grown, what we're eating and what we're wasting. And so if we can get all that stuff together, it ticks so many boxes. And regenerative agriculture is all about everything starts in the soil. Having um, healthy living soil is the key. I think and, it was on your um, talk, it was food is the umbilical cord to the soil. <laughs> yeah, that was really well, cool. Brings it home to you. Well, that, yeah, well, that's um, a Joel Salatin quote. And Joel Salatin is an American farmer who we've been fortunate enough to host. Um, he's visited New Zealand three times in the last 10 years, and we've hosted him in New Zealand. And he's an amazing guy. He's, he's an incredible communicator. He's written a number of books. Time magazine's called him the most innovative farmer in the world. And so he's been a really big inspiration mm. for us. And and yeah, the, one of his quotes is, food is our ecological umbilical cord that connects us to the ecosystem that grew it. And just understanding that we are what we eat yep. and therefore the health of that ecosystem that's producing that food is going to directly impact our health. Have you come across Dr. Zach Bush? Yes, I'm a big fan of Zach Bush. Yeah. <laughs> He's yeah. amazing. I listen to most of his stuff as well. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. 
Yeah, phenomenal. My dad decided when I was 11, so we're talking 50 years ago now, that he suddenly wanted to be a farmer. He was in computers at the time. And my uncle, this was in England on the Isle of Wight, there was a farm up for sale next door for 173 acres. I guess it was a baptism of fire, but he really reveled in it. But I think the financial side of things after about six years just got too much. The only thing I can remember is that harvest time where all the communities would come together because the farms were small and we used to share machines and things like that. It was definitely all hands on deck. And I can remember fields lying fallow, which doesn't seem to be a thing nowadays. Is that a part of the regenerative practice or does it depend on what we're doing? It does. It, it always depends. And we talk about context when every farmer, every person has a different context of what they're trying to achieve and, and their relationship with the land and the outcomes that they want. Going back to our situation, a big one for us was trying to produce food without fossil fuel yep. inputs. So that, that means we've got away from a lot of that cropping because even where land lies fallow, and that's what was done prior to you know the glyphosate and the chemicals, you know, land gets ploughed and it's left for a time for the, the weeds or grasses to drop, die down before it gets cultivated again. And, and I guess more recently, that means the land's out of production for quite some time yep. if it's in fallow like that. And so that has been speared up over recent years by spraying out paddocks. And then they've got a shorter turnaround so they can cultivate them but still get the same weed control. But yes, as Zach Bush talks about, that comes with a pretty high price, and yeah, which yeah. they're seeing certainly in America. Yeah, basically, I think it shows up in every person's urine sample or something like that, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's everywhere. Yeah. yeah, it's phenomenal. And the inflammation and the increase in asthmas and all sorts of diseases that just weren't around beforehand. And connecting all the dots. And as you say, you go back to the soil and tend the soil that grows the food. Now, that's a huge part of it. And the other side is actually the mental side. So how has that improved your own mental health? And how do you see it affecting the farming community as well? I think it's fair to say, and if I <laughs> another book that I'll reference is an Australian book by Charles Massey, who wrote a book called The Call of the Reed Warbler. And he, as an older, well, probably my age man, went and did some more university study and looking at regenerative agriculture. And he interviewed a number of regenerative farmers around Australia. And what he found that people sort of come into this often after some crisis point in their life, whether it's the challenge of losing the farm because things aren't working out economically or a health challenge or whatever it may be. I think a big part of it is it kind of cracks your ego. And I think a lot of what we're doing is you're trying to evolve beyond ego and show some humility about working with the land. And, and when you start doing that, from this book, they're saying that you know, a lot of farms, you fall in love with farming again and just start working with nature. Yeah. And you start observing a whole lot of things that you wouldn't otherwise be looking so closely at. And it's observing nature and, and working with it. And so that is just really positive mindset to be in. And you mentioned you know, your family farm and, and people working together. And it's, it's a loss of connection, I think, is at the root of almost everything that we yep. challenges we face now, and including mental health issues and, and that too, just that connection to the land and, and connection to community and people working together and supporting each other. Yeah, they're all important things for our health and well-being. I can also remember when the kids were young, my husband at the time was working on a chicken farm so they come in at a few days old and six weeks later they'd go out all pumped full of various chemicals and I can remember the boss being really pissed off with the entire chain that was dictating to him how to run his farm and I guess that is a huge part of it I'm just kind of picking up on what you were saying earlier you're more in control and you create your own guidelines and reasons and you're not a production machine, basically. You know, um, it's like milk and that kind of thing. If you're not producing X amount of produce, then you're wiped off the board. Or if you don't follow so-and-so guidelines, then you can't be part of it. You're beholden to something else outside of your control. And this way, it's actually recognizing. And I think people are really coming to terms with it. 
nature is the one that has control. We cannot dominate her. No, exactly. But with that also is trust, I think, is massive. You know, we've forgotten that to trust nature. And again, we think that we can have to control every pest and disease. And nature's got it all worked out. And the more we can learn from that and work with it, the better off we're going to be. But, you know, the challenges are still there as part of even if you're a regenerative farmer, you know, there still is a reality of economic challenges. You know, you still have to be making money and you know, it depends on your debt situation. And a lot of people feel locked into just sticking with the traditional methods and ideology because you don't want to take a risk. And, and you you mentioned Zach Bush before. I mean, I really like what he's done in America. They've started a, a not-for-profit called Farmer's Footprint. Yeah, And yeah. in that, I think they have like three points. They're trying to educate farmers yeah. um, about the benefits, but they also take away the risk because there's the, the crop guarantee programs, like an insurance for farmers. And wow. I think you know, if they can guarantee the farmers that they're going to earn at least as much money using some of these regenerative farming practices as they would if they use the more chemical input system, yep. then that gives the farmers more confidence to try something different. That, yeah, and, and with the support, they I think generally they're finding that they're going to get better results anyway and make more profit. But then they also, with that farmer's footprint, also trying to educate consumers and food eaters why they should be supporting that as well. So it's both because you know farmers can't do it all by ourselves. And the reality is that the farmers are being pushed into this mass produce things as cheaply as possible, regardless of you know environmental and food quality issues, because it's being driven by people shopping at supermarkets wanting the cheapest food. So all have a part to play in this. And, and that's the really cool thing about regenerative agriculture and the and the time that we find ourselves in is that we all have a role to play. And I just encourage people to connect with where their food is coming from if possible grow some yourself get your hands in the soil get a bit of understanding but we can't produce it all ourselves and so connect with farmers where you can learn about their production systems and support them to um, do a better job and make the changes that we all want absolutely i mean it's just popped into my head last week leif cox was talking about rewilding and one of the most important things was about the collective can't work in isolation and I know myself and my own generation and you're not too far behind me is we're trying to do things on our own and as you spoke of the ego earlier it's like to prove something to succeed to produce to say that I'm successful well actually it's a load of bollocks isn't it really because our quintessential nature is to be a part of community and nature yeah that's, again, another huge learning that I've had. And there's a film that came out about 2010 called I Am. And in that, it just talks about the difference between the narrative that I guess we live by at the moment about it being competition, you know, Darwinian dog eat dog, survival of the fittest sort of stuff. And that's kind of what we live by. And we've got an economic system that kind of thrives on that scarcity mindset. Mm -hmm. But really, we are at our happiest and at our best. And nature works in competition and it's collaborative. And that's what, to take back that story and understand that we're all better off. And again, learning from nature because that's how she works. Yeah, it's, it's all about cooperation. And that's the big change and the, the opportunity that the time that we're at at the moment. And I guess I'm just drawing from other things that I've been reading recently. A lot of it is we have the answers to things at the end of our fingertips, but I think we've lost that ability to trust in the universe because it's hard to not know or not have the answer for something. And actually, like nature, is to be patient and let it unfurl. I'm, I'm also referenced in one of my interviews with Island Bird Song, where they're trying to bring back the native birds and regenerate the land. But you know, he said it was a fine line between human intervention with the vegetation and sitting back and watching nature and see what she brings in naturally without disrupting that biodiversity. Fascinating. Yes. Eh? And then that comes back to trust again, isn't it? It's yeah. trusting nature. Yeah, that's that's a big learning. And, and and as you say, I mean, at the moment and and again referencing where we're at because I really think that humanity and life on earth is at, at a crossroads and there's two paths ahead of us 
And we're probably already quite a wee way down one path. And over the last couple of years, where so much of people's lives has gone virtual, online, disconnecting with nature, AI, transhumanism, where all that stuff's leading, which is again, you know, massive to human health. But the other path is connecting back to nature, eating real food, getting back into community. The time is really about what is it to be human and what are we all here for? We don't have the answers. And going back to your thing before, we have to learn to be comfortable with not knowing. And comfortable and, with and, discomfort. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And trusting. Absolutely. And the good thing that has come out of the lockdown, it actually has woken a lot of people up to the fact that they were working on automatic pilot in their lives and help them to rest and recuperate and establish what is important to them and reevaluate their values really so it depends on what you buy into and the bullshit that delivered on the main media are one source of truth irrespective Mm -hmm. of what your beliefs are I think it's helped everybody along that line and the momentum is really gathering and both Leaf last a week he was talking about a future full of hope and your talk was about hope and my motto is about hope lightning difficulties and it actually lightens the conversation and lifts everyone's vibration up to see things from a different perspective. Absolutely I mean it's incredibly exciting times that we live in because you know there is so much change happening and it has to happen and that's where you have to get comfortable with yep. change and unknowns I really do believe in, and going back to the drawdown book you know the solutions are all here we yes. don't need any new technology no. all we need to do is reconnect mm-hmm. with nature with ourselves with community as you've talked about before that incredible healing power of nature whether that be in the oceans yep. their ability to heal our ability to heal, getting the carbon from the atmosphere back into the soil. If we increase, I think there's something like 5 billion hectares of agricultural land in the world. And if we increase those soils by 1.6%, which is very achievable, very easy to do, that would take about 100 parts per million of carbon out of the atmosphere, put it safely down in the soil, where um, having the higher carbon content in the soil allows those soils to hold more water. So I think like a a 1% increase in soil carbon allows the soil to hold about another 160,000 litres of water per hectare. So it makes us more resilient. Those soils are going to have more nutrients in them, so you're going to be producing healthier food. That's just win, win, win stuff. And we know how to do this. Yeah. And we've just got to break away from that sort of industrial dominating mindset and totally achievable. And the other thing about that is it feels really good to be part of the solution and working with it and planting trees and making the world a more beautiful place. Yeah. And it's really exciting to be on that path and working with others to get the same outcomes. I believe you have a dream for New Zealand to be the world's first regenerative nation. Well, that's it. Again, like I said, New Zealand being you know one of the last big land masses in the world to be inhabited by humans. And, and I just would love to wind back the clock. I'd love to have a time machine and go back you know, only a thousand years or so ago, a blink of the eye in geological, ecological time frames. And even the homelands where you came from originally, yeah, there was a lot going on there a thousand years ago. And we would have been, what would this country have looked like? Just a land of forest and bird. And I just think such abundance. And so we're best placed in the world, I think, with a small population and a still functioning democracy and people that are largely connected with the environment still. And and, New Zealanders do treasure our environment. Yep. And I think we have the best potential to basically embrace this mindset, this this change of heart. Mm-hmm. If we can't do it, who the hell on earth can? Yeah, brilliant. I've got another question and you can avoid it if you want to. Cows are being made into scapegoats at the moment as far as the emissions are concerned. I mean, yes, there is a problem with the volume of it and how the farming is done, but I think it's like a typical approach to solving the problem is to kill them all off and say mm. that they're the big problem as opposed to looking at how we can integrate it. What's your thoughts on yeah. that? 
Absolutely. It does seem like cattle in particular are being made a scapegoat at the moment. And those two paths that I talked about before, yep. it does really seem that there's some Silicon Valley kind of driven fake food agenda. Yep. Yes. Um, yep. Who knows where that is really coming from or going. But yeah, obviously, it's easy to financialize those processed foods coming from cropping systems, whether it be soy or lab grown produce. With the cattle, it's not the cow, it's the how. And it's like any food that we eat, and it's more about how it's produced and where than what. Mm. And that's where I think you know, a lot of the vegan, vegetarian, omnivore debate are misguided because it's not that simple. It's complex. You know, like I said, our driver was getting fossil fuels out of our food. And in New Zealand, it takes about 10 calories of fossil fuel energy to produce every calorie of food that we eat. And it's even higher in America where big cropping farms and tractors and high inputs and everything like that. And so we're literally eating fossil fuels at the moment. And if we are at that point of time where fossil fuel are going to start decreasing in their availability, yep. then that's taking away our food system. And so relying on a vegan diet, apart from vegetables, which we can grow plenty in New Zealand, you know, that the pulses and rice and pasta grains and everything like that is all imported product. And, and I think part of what we need to do is, is become resilient in our own food production as well. And so just understanding that and understanding that animals play an essential role in an ecosystem yep. because they're part of the nutrient cycling. And so even if you choose not to eat animals, that's fine. Yep but they need to be part of the system to help recycle nutrients. Absolutely. Is, mm. Another big thing, so far as food is concerned, is to eat by the seasons. Yes. So I try not to buy anything that comes, it's bloody hard. It's a bit like trying to do your shopping without getting any plastic in the house, but not getting anything that is produced out of season from another country. And yep. I think the more conscious we are with our shopping and, and what we buy, the demand will go down and so it'll help the system. But it can't be done tomorrow. It's a process. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I haven't studied it closely, but I am looking at the state of America, China, Western Europe and that and the droughts that they're going through at the moment and then adding on you know, complications of less food being grown because of energy issues in Europe. And, and again, back to the COVID situation, people actually saw empty supermarket shelves, which was a bit of a wake up call for a lot of people. And so I think there should be a real drive also to look at your resilience of your local food economy and, and where it's coming from, because we're at that time where if energy supplies are reducing, then we are going to have to localise a lot more. That's a big movement in itself, isn't it? Localisation. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and it's better for the environment. Our goal in New Zealand should be to feed our own population well, but to be producing the highest quality yep. food. We're exporting as much as we're importing, which to me is complete bloody nonsense. Somehow we have to you know, just bring all this sort of stuff back inside natural boundaries and energy boundaries we should be helping to empower people all around the world to become ecologically literate and to grow their own food, take responsibility more yep. um, supporting that so that there is less sort of shifted around the planet. I spoke to Gareth Hughes from AFRA, which is the Food Rescue Alliance, mm -hmm. and the amount of food that because it's the wrong shape, size or whatever, that it's thrown away it's not put on the shelves and it's just ridiculous really and there's enough to go around but we need to be more mindful of the way that we're growing it and how we're distributing it to ensure that everybody is fed now just going back to what you were talking about the earlier is really sustainability and another thing that came out of your talk was doing less bad because again that's a bit of a trendy word and greenwashing is a word that's actually used quite a lot recently they're focusing on the bad bits opposed to the good that's being done. So it's not about doing less bad. It's about doing more good for the people and the planet. I'm very wary of the words that we use because like anti this and anti that, why not say what it is that you actually want as opposed to what you're against and use that mm -hmm. as your focus. And so 
sustainability and regenerative farming is all about enhancing the environment for people and the planet. And that's it simply. And there are problems, obviously, that need to be addressed, but they shouldn't be the main focus. It's Mm -hmm. about presenting the purpose of what your movement is. It's more important than what's under. Exactly. And and it's like focusing on the positive, isn't it? Well, it's it's not to deny what's happening, but it creates the momentum. And, And that's the big thing I picked up from your talk was how full of hope you were and you seem really fulfilled as an individual because of what you're doing because you're not only contributing to your own life but it's making a difference to your community to your nation and to the planet at large yeah definitely and and because yes we are told aren't we just we have to reduce our footprint the best that we could do is less bad and the planet would be better off without us I believe that we do have a reason for being here and we do have a role to play And that's to be active participants in the healing and the regeneration. Basically step back into the circle of life again and realise that we're a part of nature, not a part from nature. And therefore, you know, again, we've all got a role to play. I've been fortunate that I haven't had to struggle with a lot of mental health issues and that. But I imagine that purpose and meaning has to pay some part of it. And I do feel for young people these days when all they're hearing is so much bad news, but there are a lot of young people that are wanting to get back on the land and grow food and and wanting to be part of the solution. And, And so just letting them know that those opportunities are out there and whatever their passion is, if you're giving that in service to life, then I'm sure you're going to be a whole lot happier. People talk about finding their purpose, but for me, it's more about the meaning it has and so if you happen to be artistic you know we're all very quick at judging that it's not going to be productive or you're not going to make money or you're not going to become a success if you do x y and z we need to just open our minds and embrace everybody's gifts because they can contribute in some form or other yeah I think courage is huge at this stage we do need courage to face the reality of the situation that we're in and not shy out away from it because you know there's plenty of distractions it's just that change is happening actually I'm really optimistic and excited by the chaos because it is a gift to create something new and it has to happen it's a birthing process and it can be bloody and ugly and painful but ultimately something beautiful can be born yeah drop another book and there have you come across um charles eisenstein oh my goodness um, yes <laughs> yeah of course and and like no that goes to the title of one of his books uh, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible yeah and again zach bush his real aha moment that he often talks about is that the key to it all is beauty yeah and if we are just working to create a more beautiful world then whether you're making music or art or food or relationships, if everything is just heading more to beauty, then we've got to be heading in the right direction. It's actually noticing it, though, because we have lived a life where we're blinkered from it because we're so busy trying to prove ourselves and move forward that the other day I was just sat outside and watching this spider make its web going up and down. Fascinating. Just five minutes. It is so important. So just to round it off, because you've mentioned a few books anyway, and I have to tell the listeners, because I always tell my guests what the last four questions are to give them time to think about it. And you gave me this amazing list of books and this amazing list of inspirational quotes. So let's start with the books, because there must have been at least 100 books that you put in there. Do you have a favourite book and or person that has influenced you in your life? Well, I guess with the books, I'm just sort of thinking to when my mindset really changed because I grew up in a very conventional way and conventional agriculture bringing in at Massey. You know, there was a few life changing events back at that time that did make me change. But, you know, one of the books was Ishmael by Daniel Quinn, which is a a book narrated by a gorilla. And it sounds stupid now, but 20 years ago, it made me realize that huh, it's not all about us because he's speaking from an animal's point of view. I know this sounds weird, but it's a really good book. Yeah. Last week, Leif was talking about the orangutans and them being the most noble type of human because they are our closest relative because the way that they think and they integrate. 
it's fascinating. So there's nothing silly about it. Having talked to a penguin and having had a penguin talk to me, I'm on the same page as you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Again, that's learning from nature, isn't it? So, so that was quite a big one. There's one called The Journey, a lady called Brandon Bays. And just yeah. to remember a quote from that, I ended up reading the whole book one night and kind of just waking up. Um, or not, my wife was sort of waking up just as the sun was coming up in the morning. I sort of had a tear rolling down my cheek. But this woman overcame cancer. Quote that she said that I remember from that book was, um, know that everything that happens to you as a surprise, as a gift from God, if you use it, and the way to learn from it and grow. Mm. And we were just getting over the death of our first child at the time. Oh. We already understood that that was an opportunity to learn and grow and make you stronger. We all find, I think, it's these really tough times in life when we come through them that we grow the most. Mm. And I guess from that experience and that time, still with humility, but just knowing that whatever life chucks at you is, is an opportunity mm. and something to learn and grow from. I'm just <laughs> following a gentleman by the name of Peter Crone at the moment, and he's a mindset architect. And he says that life presents circumstances from which to learn, basically. It is a gift, and our resistance to it is what stops us from evolving and growing. And it's an acceptance of it. You, know, you experience the hardest thing that anyone could ever experience is losing a child. It's really touching to know that reading a book can actually help you move on. This is why I make reference to it at the end, because for people to tune in and to recognize that whatever happened to them, that they can evolve, that they don't have to be stuck. And it is a process. And you've been talking about the last 20 years, so it doesn't happen overnight. I've right. been on this journey for 20 years or so. The more I discover, the more I discover I don't know. And it becomes more and more fascinating. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So, yes, it's the life school, isn't it? We're here to learn and experience and grow. And with that mindset, and you know, again, it makes you a whole lot more trusting with whatever is going on on the planet at the moment, which we don't know and don't understand. But ultimately, good always prevails. Yep. And the solutions are here. And, and then also, I think a big one helps you understand to not judge others and just understand that they're coming from where their life experiences come from and where yeah. they're going and to be the change as we see it, just with kindness and compassion. And another book, if I might. Yeah, <laughs> um, have you ever heard of Joanna Macy? No. Um, she's an American woman, but with a Buddhist tradition. One of her books is called Active Hope, How to Face the Mess We're In Without Going Crazy. Oh, that sounds so, like a good one. Yeah, it's kind of quite helped in this day and age. The sort of three actions. One is like working on yourself to find that deeper connection and peace and yeah. joy within yourself. Two is working to try and prevent the destruction of the world that we know. And three is working to create that new future that we all want. And sort of if you can spread yourself between those three things, you'll be a whole lot better off to cope with life. Absolutely. And I think the first thing is, and we're not taught it, is really about building that relationship with ourselves first, because once we have that connection to ourselves, we're no longer looking to the external to feed us, then it's easier and we're lighter and more able to integrate and be a part of it and not be affected by the judgments. So what do you yeah. do to help you get out of a funk? Well, I guess it's a few deep breaths. Just becoming present in the moment. Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power yeah. of Now, and you know whether that be taking a walk and connecting nature, meditation, or just taking those deep breaths and becoming present with where you're at right now. Don't need to think about the future too much or think about the past. Just be in the present. Yep. And it's actually, this too shall pass. It's sitting with that discomfort, going back to our earlier conversation, knowing that it's not going to be there forever. But you yeah, have to absolutely. feel it because if you push it down and deny it of yourself, yes. then that's when um, the shit hits the fan. Absolutely. So if yeah. I was your fairy godmother and could grant you one wish in the world, what would your wish be and why? I think if we could teach all children to learn meditation, I think in 10 years time, there'd be no war or conflict on the planet. Yeah, I think we get to find that peace and love within ourselves through those kind of processes 
also get to understand the interconnectedness of all life on the planet. And, and I think, again, that's our opportunity at this time and why it's so exciting because more and more people are doing it. And there is that growing awareness. And I guess, you know, through the internet, you know, we're able to connect and learn a lot more about this stuff. But my favourite author at the moment is Jamie Wheel. He's recently written a book called Recapture the Rapture. I think it's like Rethinking God, Sex and something like that. Okay. And, you know, modern times. And it's just about optimising our human experience. And, and again, Zach talks about the potential for our health and our body's ability to heal ourselves. There's just all this potential that really are just beginning. Yeah, it's untapped. Um, if we can keep it all together mm -hmm. and look after this planet that sustains us there is a really really exciting time ahead well it's been a breath of fresh air talking to you Greg thank you so much for your time it's been an absolute pleasure and a great insight cool thank you lovely speaking with you too Philippa and yeah a kindred spirit yeah best wishes to everybody out there listening thanks for your time take care bye pleasure. bye isn't it wonderful to know that there are heart-centred, open-minded, caring humans like Greg who genuinely care for the land? All the books he mentioned are provided with links in the show notes. He sent me a beautiful poem entitled A Hopi Elder Speaks, which I feel compared to share with you as it reiterates both Greg and Leif's urgent message to see the value of all parts to creating a whole new vibrant world. You've been telling the people that this is the 11th hour. Now you must go back and tell the people that this is the hour. And there are things to be considered. Where are you living? What are you doing? What are your relationships? Are you in the right relation? Where is your water? Know your garden. It is time to speak the truth. Create your community. Be good to each other and do not look outside of yourself for the leader. Then he clasped his hand together, smiled and said, this could be a good time. At this time in history, we are able to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment that we do, our spiritual growth and journey comes to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves, banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary, and all that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. There is a river flowing now, very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel they are being torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know the river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river, keep our eyes open and our heads above water. And I say, see who is there with you and celebrate. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Next week, I'll be talking to Paul Frasca from Sustainable Salons in Australia, who set up a network of resources 12 years ago across New Zealand and Australia to deal with salon waste that was previously being sent to landfill. Make sure you follow or subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out. And remember, all feedback and reviews are much appreciated as are your suggestions for subjects or guests you'd like me to consider, just email me on info at philipparos.com. So until next week, dig deep, open your mind to a world of possibilities, live life with a generous heart and take steps to minimise waste and maximise your own potential. <laughs>